um, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening um, to our participants tuning in online as well as here at the Secretariat Headquarters in Suva. Uh, my name is Nola Fasau, and um, I have the honor this morning just to introduce uh, our moderator. But before I do so, I wish to recognize the Honorable Secretary General Henry Puna, uh, as well as uh, dignitaries, excellencies in the room, uh, senior officials, and uh, colleagues from around the Blue Pacific as well, of course, as all those who have registered and are um, continuing to join online. Thank you very much for making time over the next uh, 90 minutes for this uh, important session. Uh, as we all know, we are here today because of the shared concerns that we have um, and our uh, commitment to securing our Pacific Ocean, our Blue Pacific, um, and our entire globe really against uh, the threats of nuclear contamination. Um, so at this moment, I would just like to now pass over to uh, the moderator, but just by way of some very brief introductions. Um, I have the great honor of introducing uh, Rhea Moss Christian, very well known and respected throughout the region. Ria is from the Republic of the Marshall Islands and currently resides in Ponape in the Federated States of Micronesia. Ria was formerly the chair of the Marshall Islands National Nuclear Commission. And prior to this, she served as the chair of the Western uh, and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. Um, the first woman to ever serve in that role. And most recently, she was appointed as a executive director of the commission. Um, the, this is an important commissioning, a commission governing um, the world's largest tuna fishery, which conserves and manages fish, fish stocks across the Western and Pacific Central Ocean, um, a role that she begins in March of this year. So over to you, uh, Rhea, thank you. Thank you very much, Nola, and a very warm welcome to all of our participants joining us today, both online as well as in Suva. And a special uh, hello and greeting on behalf of myself and the panel to Secretary General Puna, who we will hear from very shortly. Today, we'll be hearing the perspectives of the Pacific Islands Forum independent panel of experts on the status of the wastewater release from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. It is my honor and privilege to be your moderator for today's discussion. Just by way of setting the scene very briefly to remind us of why this discussion is taking place. On March 11th, 2011, a powerful earthquake struck 45 miles off the eastern coast of Japan in the Pacific Ocean, causing an equally powerful tsunami that destroyed several coastal towns in at least three different prefectures in eastern Japan. <clears throat> the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in the town of Okuma was not spared from that tsunami, and as a result became the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl in 1986. In April of 2021, the government of Japan announced its basic policy on the handling of Advanced Liquid Processing System Treated Water, or ALPS, at the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant. The policy being that TEPCO, which is the Tokyo Electric Power Company, would conduct discharge of the ALPS treated water into the sea. And this would be subject to the approval of the Japanese Nuclear Regulation Authority. In our session today, we will hear from four scientists with extensive experience and knowledge on the subject of radiation in the environment, which includes the land, ocean, and all living things. This panel will share with us their independent assessment of Japan's policy and plans for the treated wastewater at Fukushima, and we will also hear the panelists' views about potential alternatives worthy of further consideration. 
Members of the Pacific Islands Forum are rightfully concerned about Japan's plans for Fukushima, given the importance of the ocean and its resources to supporting and sustaining Pacific Islander livelihoods. And I commend the efforts of the Forum Secretariat to ensure its members are armed with the best possible information to be able to address and respond to uncertainties. I will introduce our panel members in our outline for today shortly. But first, I'd like to invite the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, Mr. Henry Puna, to deliver his welcome remarks. Secretary General, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator, Ray Moss Christian. Excellencies, members of the independent panel of scientific experts, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, Bulavinaka, Diorana, and warm greetings from the Pacific. I am so pleased to welcome you to this public seminar and to offer some brief opening remarks. The focus of this seminar is an important issue that remains outstanding for our forum family, one of great concern not only for our region today, but for many generations to come. Indeed, our leaders continue to reiterate the urgent threat of nuclear contamination and the need to safeguard the future of our beloved Blue Pacific continent. On this particular issue, I recently re released an opinion piece in The Guardian two weeks ago. There, I expressed my views on a number of key issues and reiterated the position of Pacific Island countries to genuine dialogue and the importance of working towards a common understanding that is underpinned by approaches to prioritize and protect ocean life, human health, and our environment. History teaches us that we cannot wait four decades to figure things out. Noting that Japan has indicated that the discharge will take place over the next 40 years. Instead, we must know and understand the full terms of any action that has the potential to have a major impact on our region. In particular, we must prevent actions that will lead or mislead us towards another major nuclear contamination disaster at the hands of others. Our people continue to endure on a daily basis the long-term impacts of the nuclear testing legacy. So we know firsthand the intergenerational impacts and radioactive nuclear waste. To this very day, a just resolution of this legacy remains very evasive. So you can understand our concerns about the implications of the planned discharge by Japan. As we have seen with climate change, our concerns have a sound scientific basis. And today you will learn a bit more about this from the independent panel of experts. I am encouraged by the recent advocacy by the US National Association of Maritime Laboratories, an organization of more than 100 members who have opposed the current plans based on lack of adequate and accurate scientific data supporting Japan's assertion of safety. I want to make clear that this process in no way undermines the important work of the International Atomic Energy Agency. However, I strongly urge that we take the time to closely examine whether current international safety standards are adequate to handle the unprecedented case involving a large volume of radioactive wastewater from damaged nuclear reactors as opposed to that discharge in normal operations. Make no mistake, 
the region is steadfast in its position that there should be no discharge until all parties verify through scientific means that such a discharge is safe. Furthermore, taking the easy way out in this unprecedented case could well open the Pandora box and lead to widespread ocean dumping that disregards the concerns and livelihoods of small island coastal communities. As stated by many forum members, we should rather err on the side of caution. There is no doubt in my mind that more time is absolutely necessary to fully consider all implications of such a decision before choosing the course of action that is not only in the best interest of Japan, but also of all Pacific Island countries. To this end, it is paramount that the public is fully aware and takes part in these conversations. While these issues are highly complex and technical, I urge all of us to take the time to listen, to learn, and to help in shaping how we can best work together with Japan on this critical and important issue. Finally, I wish to specifically thank the panel members, Dr. Kian Busala, Dr. Arjun Mahjani, Dr. Tony Hooker, Dr. Ferenik Talnoki Veres, and Dr. Robert Richman. I am so grateful for their ongoing support and their frank and honest opinions. Thank you also to our moderator, Raya Moss Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I wish you all the very best in today's discussions, and I count on our collective leadership and voice to steer us forward on this very important issue for our region. I thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General Puna, for your important remarks and for reminding us why we all must be vigilant about this issue, not only those of us living in the Pacific Islands, but also our friends and neighbors around the world. A healthy ocean is in everyone's best interests. Turning now to our panel members, I have the honor to introduce four distinguished scientists who I had the privilege of working with during my time at the Marshall Islands National Nuclear Commission. Each of these panelists brings a depth and breadth of experience to their res respective areas of research and expertise. But what I appreciated most about this group is their focus on making science and scientific findings easily accessible by the general public. And I think you will agree with me after you hear their presentations today. The knowledge shared by our panelists spans several decades of experience and the leadership of Pacific Islands Forum members will undoubtedly be advanced by the advice and information from this panel. Dr. Ken Busler is a senior scientist and oceanographer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts. Dr. Arjun Makajani is the president for the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Dr. Frank Dalnoki Vares is a scientist in residence and an adjunct professor at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. And Dr. Robert Richmond is a research professor and director at Kualo Marine Laboratory at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In terms of our outline for today, Dr. Busler will start us off with an introduction to radioactivity sources in the oceans and set the scene for helping us understand how Fukushima impacts our current picture. Dr. Dalnoki Vares will then take us through the data and help us understand the information that we do have and the implications of the data that we don't have. Dr. Makajani will supplement Dr. Dalnoki Vares with a discussion on data adequacy and accountability, including alternatives that deserve further consideration. And finally, Dr. Richmond will address the impacts of radiation in our environment, which includes human health, and he will discuss opportunities that arise from an unfortunate tragedy. 
Following all of the presentations, we will open the floor for questions to our panel. The protocol that will follow is for all questions to be submitted to the webinar Q&A section if you are joining us online or through the Pacific Islands Forum Facebook page, which is being monitored during this session. And for those of you participating live from Suva, please approach the MC there who will assist you with the microphone to ask your questions. I will compile the questions through the Q&A and those that come to me from the forum secretariat in Suva and open the questions to the panelists to answer for 30 minutes at the end of our session. So with that, I'm happy to turn the floor over to Dr. Busler to get us started. Thank you, Rhea. So I think someone at Suva has some slides to turn on as we get going here. Uh, as that happens, I just want to thank you, Rhea, for introducing me. Thank you to the PIF for setting up this forum and to the audiences, whether you're online and watching this or in Suva. Uh, we've got a big job here. We wanna really get into some details, but also get back to the basics of radioactivity. That'll be my goal at the first part of this. Uh, what you're going to hear is a set of opinions from five, well, four of the experts are here, but essentially a consensus from the five of us who are asked to advise the Pacific Islands Forum on what we felt were the issues related to the release of the radioactive waters from Fukushima Daiichi. So as I said, I'll introduce this. Uh, after that, Frank will talk about the accident itself, that it's not over and what we do and don't know what's about in the tanks. We're gonna talk a lot about the adequacy of the data, the accountability, and then Bob's gonna end up telling us about the health impacts, of course, that we're all concerned about and how we might turn this tragedy into an opportunity. So with that outline, we can move to the next slide. And so something I wanted to do is just get right to the punchline, right? Uh, hopefully you stay with us for the whole 90 minutes, but basically what we're trying to convey are four big points here. And this is the reconsideration is one way to put it that we're urging TEPCO in Japan right now is we truly feel that this decision to release water uh, is not supported by the quantity and quality of the data. We need more information to make that type of decision. So you'll hear more about that. You'll hear a lot about tritium. It's a radioactive form of hydrogen that is of concern, but there are other forms of radioactivity that are also of concern and less easy to clean up. So we're gonna get into not just tritium, but the other forms and elements that we have entering the ocean through this pipeline, through this process. You can hear about accumulation on the sea floor and in marine food products because not all of these mix with the water. So we're gonna to have to learn about that. And then you're gonna hear a bit at the end about alternatives and uh, an opinion that we have that there, despite the photograph on the left there with the tanks at Fukushima Daiichi, there is area outside, there is area on site. So we don't have to make a decision today for what might affect the Pacific Ocean for decades. Uh, and centuries to come. So with that, we'll get to my first slide, but my job is to go through these slides. I'm an oceanographer. Uh, I study radioactivity in the ocean. My early PhD work, I've been doing this for over 35 years, related mostly to some of the weapons testing fallout that was done in your region. I've been to the Marshall Islands to look at some of the test sites, but measuring more generally radioactivity around this planet whether it's from nuclear testing, natural sources, things like Chernobyl uh, or Fukushima. So let's get on to those slides and talk about that. So the first thing we really wanna bring everyone on board, you hear this word radiation, and basically that's the process caused by these unstable atoms that break down and emit radioactivity, that high energy particles, the radioactive, uh, forces that we're concerned about that can cause health effects. And so when that's happening, we often will measure those decay events. It's basically a breakdown, a decay process. Not all elements do this, but many do. And every time that happens, we call that a decay event. And if there's one per second, that's called a Becquerel. So you might see this unit. I'm just saying this up front because 
you know, you can't taste or feel or smell or see radioactivity. We have to measure it somehow. And if you've been around uh, people using like Geiger counters, right? You hear the click, 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 click. As they get close to the source, you get more clicks. Each of those clicks is a decay event that we're gonna call a Becquerel. And we're gonna measure that per most of the data per cubic meter of water or per kilogram of fish, how much radiation is in seawater or in seafood, for example, or on the seafloor. So that's the primer. I think that's enough to move on to the next slide. And it's also important to know for general audiences, I don't know where the words went, there we go, uh, that there's many sources of radioactivity in this world we live in. We're all exposed continuously, either through the rocks, the ground, the soil where we live. So we call those naturally occurring radionuclides. Things here in New England where I live, uh, rocks, granite rocks have higher abundance, say of uranium minerals that release things like radon gas. Cosmogenic radioactivity, that's basically caused by high energy particles in the atmosphere that interact with materials to create cosmogenic forms. And actually tritium is cosmogenically produced. We'll get into that. But we're mostly concerned today about human activity, things that happened in this case after the accidents in 2000 at Fukushima Daiichi. So there's many ways, many sources of radioactivity. Next slide, please. And so as an oceanographer, I'm challenged with trying to measure what's in the ocean already. And these three green circles represent the amount of cesium in that unit of Becquerel, but it's 10 to the 15 of petabecquerel. So there's a lot of cesium that was released in the 50s and 60s. The biggest circle there, close to a thousand petabecquerels of 137 cesium. Most of that's still with us. That has a half-life of 30 years. So most of that is still in the ocean. Some 60 years later, about 25% of what had been released. Chernobyl, 1986, was smaller, about 10 times smaller. We tried to indicate with the circles that was mostly a land-based accident. So most of the green is above the waterline there. And then we came along in 2011, something smaller still for this isotope of cesium. Now you'll hear, and if we can advance one click, there's many different forms of radioactivity that were released. So on this slide, if we can advance one position here, I've just picked two of them. And one was strontium-90, we're gonna hear more about that. One was tritium that you're hearing the most about. In 2011 in Japan, these were much less abundant than cesium. So a lot of attention focused on the radioactive forms of cesium. That's what my lab measured in the ocean, seafood products, others, the Japanese international scientists have looked at that. But we've also looked at what happened with the amount of strontium-90 and tritium was released. And I'll, we'll get into a bit why that's important, but it's not just one form. And then the last part of this slide is just to make the point, if we can advance, that there's not just cesium and strontium tritium in the ocean. We're often talking about in this radioactive world, I mentioned uranium comes from weathering of rocks, potassium-40. They're much more abundant but they've always been there. This is what our bodies, we've learned to live with this background radioactivity. So if we talk about background, we're talking about what's in the ocean already. So let's move along. I wanna give time here to talk about different sources now. So what happened 2011, if we can move forward one click, we had this overheating in response to the lack of electricity, explosions due to the release of hydrogen gas, and some of that went right into the atmosphere, the largest fraction. Some through cooling waters at that horrific time went into the ocean. If we move forward another couple and start adding up how much that was, cesium-137, that was one of the more abundant isotopes of concern. You're seeing that number 15 to 20 PBQ petabecquerels in the water, another three to 10. So that's what was going on in that first month. And those are very big numbers, as you saw. Now we continue to study the site. The next three clicks are gonna show us the ongoing release from rivers and groundwater. We can stop there for a second, but look at the units. It's 0, 0.0 something, 0 0.002. So the amount released today is certainly much smaller than what happened in 2011. 
doesn't mean it's zero. We still have concerns, but it's that recovery. What's been going on in the last decade that people like me will study? Tonight, though, the next click will get us to the concern about the tanks. We have over a thousand tanks, a million tons of water, water that's been used to cool those reactors, even though they've stopped producing electricity. There's a lot of heat there that has to be cooled. A lot of that water builds up because it's groundwater that enters buildings. So every day they're getting several hundred tons of water that gets accumulated, cleaned up. But in those thousand tanks, there's something like one petabecquerel of tritium and plus question mark, there's other isotopes we're gonna talk about. So see that number one, it's getting pretty big again, right? We're talking about something that's gonna rival potentially what happened in 2011. Yes, I know it's smaller, but it's much bigger than what's coming out of rivers on the site today. That's the main point of this slide. So second half of what I get to introduce, what happens? This stuff gets in the ocean, right? We've talked about different isotopes. Well, it all depends. And what that really refers to is the chemistry, the behavior of tritium and cesium and strontium will all vary because of their chemical properties. I'm in a chemistry department. And we're gonna talk about four of these very quickly, then the other speakers will expand upon them, but basically transport with the ocean currents. So when you put tritium or cesium in the ocean, that can move with those ocean currents and be diluted. We also have some of these radioactive elements that accumulate in marine life. We're gonna talk about that in two slides. And we're gonna talk about this accumulation on the seafloor. Why is that of concern or different? And then the final slide from my part will remind us about radioactive decay and what happens to all of these isotopes on very different timescales. So let's go to that next slide, which is a single slide trying to represent over the course now of about eight years. These are pictures of the Pacific Ocean, and I hope you recognize Japan there on the left, the source in 2011, in this case showing you a prediction of cesium-137. This has been verified by the RIT data. On the right side is North America. That island in the middle is Hawaii. And so what it's showing you is the spread of the material from 2011. You can see it's already about halfway across the Pacific, but as the colors indicate, the further away you go, you get lower quantity because it's mixing into that dark blue water that has less cesium. It already had some cesium in it, but nowhere near the levels that were many tens of thousands. In fact, the highest number we saw was 10 million becquerel per cubic meter. So we had a release moving quickly right below that by 2013, a couple of years later. It's still north of the Hawaiian Islands or that green set of islands in the middle, if you can see it. And it's starting to reach British Columbia, Seattle area, the west coast of the US. The colors are getting more blue, getting down to much lower levels that were considered of concern. But we could detect in 2013 by 2016 along the coast of North America, water that came from 2011 all the way across the Pacific carrying cesium. And we know if tritium's release would follow something like this pathway. So there are things we know pretty well. Now go to the next slide, but it gets complicated. And not all of that isotope, not every form moves with those ocean currents and dilutes, right? We do have these pathways, whether it's coming from the atmosphere, from the rivers, from the groundwater, that brings it into the local environment or even further afield as that plume moves. Animals in the ocean take up radioactivity as they eat and as they drink. Remember, even though they're in the ocean, they still need water. And so there's many pathways to get in them. If we look on the next slide at some specific isotopes, we'll start with cesium again, this one that was quite abundant. Its behavior is a lot like potassium, it's an electrolyte. And so it ends up in muscles and organs. When you have sports activity, you drink Gatorade or something to replace electrolytes. That's what cesium is doing when it's in the ocean, fish are swimming around and being exposed. But the biological half-life, how long it would stay in there if they moved into waters that were not contaminated might be on the order of weeks. That's one reason you have to replenish your electrolytes. If we flip one more, button here on this slide, 
you'll see strontium-90 and tritium are quite different. We'll start with strontium-90 on the right. That behaves like calcium. So think of you take calcium supplements for your bones, right? Or as you eat fish and you were to eat their bones, that stays around for years. And so its biological half-life for release is gonna take much longer. And on the left there, we'll contrast with tritium. Tritium is a radioactive form of hydrogen. You can see that H2O formula that we all saw in school, might have forgotten, but basically it behaves a lot like water, not all of the tritium. There's organically bound forms that stay longer than days, but this would go through a fish, through our systems quite quickly. So we have different forms of radionuclides moving to different parts of the food web and staying there for different periods of time. And that's something that complicates the story a little bit. So we'll go on. Next slide is the third complication or the third fate. I think it's not really even a complication. These are known things is that once you release radioactivity, yes, some of it moves with the currents. Yes, some of it gets into the marine life, but a significant fraction becomes associated with that mud, that bottom. There's a core there on the left taken just off the site from Fukushima Daiichi on a cruise I was on. There's some of the benthic marine life on the lower right. And that map, we try to indicate, it might be hard to see in gray there is the Japan and Fukushima as a star, but we've measured the Japanese in particular, the abundance of cesium itself on the seafloor, not in the water. And those areas that are darker red have maybe 10,000 times higher amounts of cesium still today in the seafloor of Japan. Yes, it's going down. I don't have time to show you the details, but I will tell you that marine organisms that live on the seafloor and consume material there can have higher levels of cesium in their bodies because of this exposure. So it's a long-term repository. It's a very different pathway than moving with currents. And so now I'll get into my final punchline here, which is just, and remember that this whole uh, lesson, I guess I'll call it, started with radioactive decay. And for elements like cesium-137, 134, if we can move one click ahead, if you release those isotopes in 2011, they have different properties, their half-life, how quickly that breakdown process is. For cesium-137, it's 30 years. So this slide was made eight years after, and we've lost about 15% of the cesium due to its decay, the 137 isotope. 134 released at the same time in about equal amounts has had four half-lives, eight years. Every two years, 50% goes away, another 50%, another 50%. There's only about 6% left in 2019. That will happen whether it's on the seafloor, moving with ocean currents or stored on land. So let's go to the next set of clicks here, we've talked a bit about strontium-90 on the right, pretty similar to cesium-137, 30-year half-life, so most of that's still around. We're gonna talk more about tritium. In these eight years, we would have lost, well, it'd be about 65% left. It hasn't been quite 12 years at that point, but it will decay relatively quick compared to the time frame that they're going to clean up this site, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, if you go 50 years out, 95% of that tritium would be gone, whether it's stored on land or put in the ocean. That's just the process. And on the very left, early on, people were concerned with iodine because of the cancer risk, 131 for thyroid. And that's a very short half-life of days. So there's essentially no risk from the shorter lived ones. I think there's one more layer to this, just to reemphasize that remember now, different radioisotopes, different fate in the ocean. Some end up in bones or tissue and they're all decaying at these different rates. So that, yes, you think maybe this is complicated again, but no, it really actually allows us to learn a lot and track these. So know exactly where they're coming from and where to expect them. It's that level of basic knowledge that we should be applying to what happens with this tank water. So I'll stop there Ray and let you move on with the other speakers. All right. Thank you, Dr. Buesler. I think that's a really helpful scene that you've set in terms of what we're looking at, um, current radiation and the implications of the Fukushima release. 
So I will now pass to Dr. Dalnoki Vares to talk to us about what we know about what's in the tanks and what we don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so first, thanks to the Pacific Island Forum for uh, inviting us and having this very important conversation. My name is Ferenc. I'm a physicist with many years of background and experience in low concentration radioactivity counting and in particle physics. And I'm going to focus um, in some detail on the data. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, great. Perfect. Um, so I want to emphasize that this accident is not over and this is not normal operations. There's no time limit on an accident. An accident can just continue. And this is important to remember. So normal rules of not normal operations don't apply. Rainwater and groundwater has been flowing into the reactor complex from nearby mountains and the water becomes highly contaminated with radionuclides. It picks up from flowing through the reactor at 100 to 1200 meters cubed per day. To give you a sense, 100 meters cubed is 100,000 liters. And that's how much uh, additional water, the, uh, the, the burden uh, that TEPCO has to deal with. It's mostly around 180 meters cubed per day. At the high end, the 1200 meters cubed per day that happens sometimes when there's particularly rainy times, that's one half the size of an Olympic swimming pool. So TEPCO has a very difficult challenge to deal with and manage so much water and has decided to place them into tanks to manage this. In 2016, TEPCO admitted, with many of us suspected, that the water is also not stopped by the, stopped by the much hyped uh, ice wall, again in 2018, 2020, and 2022. And TEPCO has no plan to completely stop the flow of groundwater I itself. Instead, it continues to deal with the problem by putting contaminated water in tanks. The contaminated water, that's the main focus here, is a particular serious issue because Japan and TEPCO has decided to start disposing, as we discussed, of the contaminated water as soon as the summer. And that's really the focus of today. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, according to TEPCO, there are currently over 1,066 tanks holding contaminated water. To visualize how much water this is, it's the equivalent in total volume of a cube of 110 meters on each side. That's a gigantic cube of water, almost a thousand Olympic size swimming pools. And the water in the tanks is highly contaminated. Water is treated to remove the 62 different radionuclides using a system known as ALPS or multi-nuclide uh, removal facility. But in 2014, TEPCO stated that ALPS, so in 2014, TEPCO stated that ALPS will reduce strontium to non-detectable levels, which will reduce the risk of leakage and protect the safety of workers. That's a quote by that from them. But then in August 2018, Kyoto News revealed, not TEPCO, that the ALPS system was not working properly. Kyoto News revealed that the water was still highly contaminated in the tanks. TEPCO later admitted that about 66% of the treated water needs to be treated again because the water still has a high background concentration of radionuclides, and we're not just talking about tritium, other isotopes. And recently, TEPCO has also backtracked on the criterion for release and now states that the goal is to reduce levels below regulatory limits rather than being non-detectable. Next slide, please. So what is in the water? The PIF panel of scientific experts has tried to find answers to this question. And in short, we really don't know. As part of our study, we have had four meetings with TEPCO and Japanese government officials. The IA was an observer at one of the meetings. In addition, some members of the scientific panel, me included, um, were virtual observers at a meeting where IEA Director General uh, Grossi met in person with uh, Pacific Island Forum members in Suva um, in July. An important disclaimer I want to emphasize, the analysis that I will talk about is based on data shared with the Pacific Island Forum. There may be more data that TEPCO has not uh, shared with us. Um, but then I asked the question, why didn't they share it with us? In February 18th, 2022, um, the Pacific Island Forum requested data from TEPCO for uh, data for all 64 radionuclides um, that they said that they would monitor of the water in the tanks. 54 days later, about two almost two months later, we received 19 data files containing sampling data covering 4.3 years. 
Data needed extensive cleaning, and for some files, the units were not even the same for the same isotope. In addition, from file to file, the radionuclides would be in different order than in other files, which really complicated things. We immediately noticed problems with the data. And I will touch on various deficiencies of the data that the panel has considered to be serious red flags. The panel has found that some of TEPCO's sample extraction has been inadequate, incomplete, and at times inconsistent and even biased. And I will discuss uh, 10 main points. Next slide, please. So by incomplete, it really refers to the relevant data as missing from the sample, mean, meaning that important pieces of information were not included in the analysis. Inadequate refers to large gaps in the data, indicating that not enough information was collected to provide a thorough analysis. And when data is inconsistent, in these words, it refers to data that contains discrepancies or conflicts uh, within itself. And TEPCO data has shown aspect of all of these in some of their sample extraction um, and analysis. And I will discuss this in 10 uh, main, main points. Next slide. But this is perfect. Thank you. Um, so this is a plot of the number of this, one of the only plots that I'll show. Don't worry. <laughs> this is a plot of, of a number of different radionuclides analyzed per sample. And only five times over 4.3 years, and only in five tanks, have more than seven radionuclides plus tritium carbon-14 or technetium-99 been measured. Seven isotopes are strontium-90, which is bone seeker and critically important, season-134, season we already discussed, season-137, iodine-129, ruthenium-106, antimony-125, and cobalt-60. Those are the seven isotopes that TEPCO uh, tends to monitor most, not the 64 that they assured would be monitored. Not once were all 62 radionuclides measured in one sample in all the data we analyzed in any tank. Individual radionuclide concentrations were inferred using total beta particle counts or alpha counts. So these are just different particles that are using to infer what the uh, amount of concentration is for the different isotopes. But that's not the same as actually measuring it. And that's one important thing I want to emphasize. You noticed second point is that there's large gaps in the data. Look at this, I mean, this is 4.3 years from the one end to the other end. And what you see is complete gaps. And one count, one line doesn't mean just one count because this is over a year. It's something like 400 samples or 700 complete samples. Um, but you see that there's, very, there, there's areas where there's complete sparse data. Data was not, uh, not collected. So about 720 samples were taken but not all, them, not all of them were analysis of the concentration of individual radionuclides. And that's another point. About one sample for radionuclides were taken every four days over a 4.3 year period. And we also see long periods of gaps of almost six months where it appears no samples were taken for radionuclides. There may have been samples taken for total beta counts. That's a different type of particle uh, for inferring concentrations, but not for the individual uh, radionuclides. And that's the concern. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, incomplete, inadequate, inconsistent sample extraction. So data is also incomplete because a little over one quarter of the tanks, quarter of the tanks were measured over the full data set. Only a quarter of the tanks, and considering that there's you know, a thousand different tanks. No mention of mixing, which is necessary to have a representative data set. Um, Arjun, uh, Dr. Makajani is going to talk about this in, in more detail, and hardly any mention of attention to sludge. Uh, relevant data is, is actually missing from samples, as important as tank ID on a few, making it very difficult to figure out how broadly the 1,000 plus tanks were actually sampled. Other data missing are counting types, type of detector used, um, and so on. Um, so there's lots of information that's missing from these samples. Uh, and they make it difficult to assess what's actually in the tanks. Um, OK, great. Uh, no, one more, one back. <laughs> uh, one back. Oops. If, you, if yeah, it's exactly there. Sorry about that. So tanks are often not remeasured, which is another very important point for the same isotope. So temporal variation is hard to know or how representative the samples are of the full volume of the tanks. Dr. Makajani is going to talk about it in more detail. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, we also have a concern about the reliability or the consistency of the ALP system. There appear to be large variation in the radionuclide uh, ratios 
of isotopes in tanks in Alps treated water. Here we see, I'm just kind of showing, uh, this is one of the last graphs I'll show you, <laughs> kind of a snapshot of what a graph looks like um, of the variation of the strontium 90 to cesium 137 ratio as an example. And we see that the strontium 90 to cesium 137 ratio in individual tanks varies by more, in a few cases, by more than 16,000. And why that's so strange is that strontium 90 and cesium 137 are supposed to be produced roughly in the same proportion in the fission process. And so the ratio should not vary that much. So this indicates variability in the ALP system, not just in its overall efficiency of total radionuclide removal, but variability over time, maybe concentration, I don't know, in the ability to remove individual radi radionuclides at constant efficiency relative to each other. Next slide, please. Um, there's also highly questionable data. There are a number of anomalous and questionable data points and measurements in the data set provided uh, to the PIF uh, by TEPCO. For instance, in the insert, you can see very high lower limits on the radionuclide tellurium-127, which simply should not be present. The limit of detection for tellurium-127 was, by take, converting these numbers into something that makes sense, about a billion times more than what would be allowed in terms of risk factor for TEPCO. Uh, so that's you know, just very, very bizarre. Um, the isotope is actually produced through the, through the fission process and it has a half-life of only nine hours. So it even just sh should not be present at all. So there's really no point in actually looking for it. So I'm not sure why TEPCO is concerned with tellurium-127 and why it's recorded with such a high uh, limit of detection. Uh, we didn't get a satisfactory answer from TEPCO, and most likely the tellurium-127 lower limits indicate that TEPCO's measurement and data quality are just, um, you know, uh, uh, bad procedures. Um, next slide. Um, so biased data refers to data that is systematically skewed and not representative of the whole tank. Next slide, please. So TEPCO repeatedly focuses on tritium rather than the other radionuclides, which is an important bias. Even introducing a friendly character to represent tritium, which was quickly removed because of strong opposition by the public, uh, accusing the company to be insensitive to the concerns of the public. I had a little animation, but you know, <laughs> it's that little character, which is supposed to be uh, tritium, representing a cartoon figure of, of tritium. Um, so this is a graph of TEPCO's risk factor and TEPCO deems less than one to be allowable for disposal. It doesn't mean that I agree with this risk factor, but this is the risk factor that TEPCO in Japan uh, uses for different samples when tritium is excluded. So tritium is not included in these, uh, in, in these particular uh, measurements. And we see that for many, many samples, the other radionuclides also contribute to high risk. Another bias is that TEPCO always takes samples at the end of filling rather than devising a system that does it continually or, or, or does random sampling uh, from, uh, from the tanks themselves. Also, the samples are only 30 liters from the tank. That's one thousandth of a complete tank. So the sample is not representative and is also uh, biased. Next slide, please. So in July, uh, Japan's NRA, a Nuclear Regulatory Authority, authorized construction of the equipment to permit discharge. In September, TEPCO allowed the public to see the construction, you can see it pictured from uh, the uh, Stars and Stripes, of the one kilometer pipe into the Pacific Ocean. Apparently 80 meters has already been complete. I'm sure now it's much uh, longer than this. But the source term needs to be established. So the source term is kind of a technical term for saying what is in the tank. What is in the tank uh, needs to be established much better than it has been. The ability of the ALP system to handle the varied contents of the tanks, including early tanks with particulate loads and sludges uh, that may be stirred up as the tanks are being emptied, has not been satisfactory uh, established. And waiting until the time of discharge to do full and proper sampling is not appropriate from a scientific or ecological point of view. Next slide. So uh, data shared with the Pacific Island Forum uh, deemed to be inadequate, incomplete, inconsistent, and biased. It demonstrated 10 principal concerns that are red flags with sample extraction or data analysis. 
it's not clear to the panel what the source term is, or in layman's terms, I was saying layperson's terms, uh, it's not clear what is actually in the tanks. And thus far, 64 radionuclides have not been analyzed in any tank, in any data shared with the Pacific Island Forum. TEPCO will need to analyze a high throughput of data and see if they, if they go through with this uh, process of, of, uh, of dumping the, the, the water into the sea. And since they have not done that, um, they haven't really demonstrated they can actually manage to have such a high throughput of data and, and do so many measurements because they haven't done it once in the data that we've seen. The accident is not over. This is not normal operations for a reactor. TEPCO should spare no expense to consider other alternatives uh, to dumping. And exactly as uh, uh, Secretary General Puna said, we have to err on the side of caution before this uh, continues. I think with this, I'll, I'll pass it to Dr. Makajani. Thank you, Vern. Um, Vern has laid out our concerns. What I want to stress is the connection of the inadequacy and the problems of the data with our interactions with TEPCO and what we observe of the IAEA response, uh, both to TEPCO's proposals and our own observations. And, and both of them have been very troubling. Next slide. So we had four discussions with TEPCO. We looked at their data. Uh, thank you, Ferenz. You spent a lot of time bringing some order to that data. So um, it should really have been presented to us in good order. It was often presented to us very close to the actual meetings. But nonetheless, we got the job done. It's been a wonderful team. I've been very privileged to be part of it and, and thank the forum for putting this team together. So these are the problems we had. If you look at them from a scientific point of view, it should trouble anybody. Biased, unrepresentative sampling. You have to know what it is that tanks. When we raised this issue with TEPCO, they basically said, we don't need to know what's in the tanks from the point of view of discharges now. We're really measuring this to control the site boundary dose. Uh, what were they doing regarding not measuring all the radionuclides? They made some assumptions, which if you make good assumptions based on measurements, you don't need to measure 64 radionuclides every time, but you have to make good assumptions about the relationship between what you measure and what you're not measuring. So you have to make some measurements where you know all the radionuclides and establish some relationship the poor data quality control is very shocking. So when we raised this issue with TEPCO, nine hour half-life, you should not find it in 2019. They said, oh, maybe 2014. And with a nine hour half-life, you should not find it in 2014. December 2011, with a nine hour half-life, you should not find it in December 2011. So the whole thing is mysterious unless some un, um, unanticipated chain reactions are going on in the molten fuel. That question also remains unanswered. One of the main reason we need to know what's in the tanks is will the ALPS system work to clean up the water except for tritium and carbon-14 and will it work consistently? Will it work when the water is inhomogeneous, means it's not uniform and well mixed? Will it work in the tanks with sludges when you remove that water and you stir up the sludges and have lots of particles? So we have an assumption that ALPS will work, but we felt it was scientifically unsupported. When we discuss this with TEPCO, next slide, please. So as a scientist, when so I send my work out for review, all of us do who are scientists. If somebody tells me that something is seriously wrong, some assumption is unscientific, some procedure is incorrect, then you have to go back to the drawing board 
And the first step is to agree that this is a problem, if it is, and we strongly think that it is. We've had a very strong consensus on the team from the beginning. And one of the surprising things for me personally, and I say this uh, on my individual capacity, is that my concerns have grown the more we have discussed with Demco. And they have grown because as a scientist, when problems are pointed out, you have to acknowledge them. And when your acknowledge sampling is not representative, you can't just say it doesn't matter or we'll find that out at, just before the time of discharge. The main thing is, will this ALP system work in regard to the discharge plan? Will they be able to measure in that volume, 64 radionuclides when they are dead and then dilute the water in that kind of frequency? Uh, and what will happen if the ALP system does not work? And the idea was that it would just be retreated and retreated and retreated with no idea how many times it would be retreated. Uh, as Secretary General Puna pointed out, it's already 40 years. They're accumulating more water. And if you have to retreat it more times, will it go down to 50? Will it be 60? Will it be 70 years, 80 years? We don't have a good answer. So the problems we have raised are not peripheral problems. They're fundamental from the point of view of science. They're fundamental from the point of view of safety. And they're fundamental from the point of view of the ocean, which Bob is going to, Bob Richmond, Dr. Richmond is going to cover. But before that, let me talk about the IAEA. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So the, the IAEA was there during one of our meetings with TEPCO, and we also observed uh, uh, Secretary General, uh, uh, Director General uh, Grossi's presentation and discussion with the Pacific Islands Forum. This has perhaps been at least as concerning as the problems with the TEPCO data and inadequacy, because the IAEA has basically implied that current knowledge of what is in the tanks is not important because they're going to sample just before discharge, and discharge will not be allowed if radionuclide content is too high. Uh, it's too late at that time. Preparation for discharge needs to, uh, we need to know whether the ALP system is going to work. And as Ferenc has already told you, we have very strong data that shows that ALPS has not worked consistently by a long margin when you have strontium to cesium ratios that vary by tens of thousands. Um, you have a problem. Uh, and the IAEA has suggested that if the ALP system doesn't work the first time, then it can be second time, third time, with no limit to the number of passes. And as to cost and efficiency, will it work? Will it work when there are when there's water from the sludges? We did not receive an answer. These are all very fundamental problems. And we are of the view that waiting just before discharge is, is too late and those that discharge decision has to be postponed indefinitely till these dis, till these very fundamental issues can be addressed. And let me, I'll talk briefly about alternatives and then pass it to my colleague. So we, we felt that because there are transboundary issues, because there are fisheries issues, because there are many, many issues of ecology in regard to discharging such a large volume of waste, and radioactivity into the ocean that alternatives should be considered. Some alternatives have been considered, but we presented three that have not been considered. So extended storage was considered and rejected, uh, but we thought that treatment of the water with ALPS and storage in new seismically safe tanks to decay, as uh, Dr. Bissler pointed out, Tritium has a half-life of 12.3 years. So if you remove essentially all of the other radionuclides, then you can store it to decay. You're talking 40, 50, 60 years, and the problem would solve itself. Now, you don't have to store it for 40, 50, 60 years. One option we uh, proposed is that water is used to make concrete. Uh, tritium has a quite low energy beta particle, no gamma, and so it will be shielded if you mix it in concrete. 
you won't feel be able to see the radiation on a Geiger counter at the surface pretty much. And um, so it could be used to make concrete. By my calculation, it would be a lot faster than decades. And uh, Dr. Richmond will talk about bioremediation. So these three options would have thousands, orders of magnitude lower impact than the release plan. They would likely not have transboundary impacts. That is very important. And I want to call the International Radiological Scientific Authority is the International Commission on Radiological Protection. They have a publication, ICRP 24, uh, that talks about environmental protection and human protection in the same document and how we ought to proceed under different exposure situations. That's the title of the document. I just want to, so optimization of the process of discharges, releases of exposure is part of a series of things you have to consider. Justification, will it do more benefit than harm or more harm than benefit? That comes first. But if you've decided it's more benefit than harm, then you optimize. And optimized is defined by, quote, the process of determining what level of protection and safety makes exposures and the probability and magnitude of potential exposures as low as reasonably achievable economic and social factors being taken into account. TEPCO has not done that. They have not considered these much um, these options that would have much lower doses on the face of it. They, you need to consider them in more detail, but that's the preliminary idea of proposing them. They have not consider these options, which would greatly reduce social and economic impacts. Uh, and when presented, neither the IAA showed any interest, nor TEPCO showed any interest on the idea that we're going to meet the regulations. Dr. Richmond is going to talk about that. We think that indefinite postponement, addressing the data issues, consideration of the alternatives we suggest, among others, is essential before a final determination is made on what is safe. And this is part of the safety process. Uh, the, the ICRP says biota must be taken into account when there are significant releases. The same publication, different page. So with that, let me pass it on because a lot of this is about ecological principles. Let me give it back to Riyamas Christian who will pass it. Uh, speaker. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Donoki Vares and Dr. Makajani. I think uh, what you've raised are probably many more questions than answers, which is the alarming piece. But uh, just to uh, a reminder to our audience online and in Suva to have your questions in mind and go ahead and post them in the Q&A if you're online. We have some already coming through. Um, after we hear from Dr. Richmond, then we'll go to the Q&A portion. So Dr. Richmond will take us through the implications for human health and talk about some opportunities that might be available. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Rhea. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, I'd also like to start by thanking um, the Pacific Island Forum, the Secretary General, and the Pacific Island leaders who have impaneled us for this very important task. And I have to say, um, I've served on many scientific panels and committees, and I'm just so impressed not only with the quality of the people on this panel in terms of their scientific knowledge, but their dedication to really wanting to ensure that the information we provide to the decision makers at the Pacific Island Forum and worldwide is accurate, it's adequate, and clearly represented. And I think this came across from all three of the previous presenters is it is concerning to us that science has a responsibility to inform and to share information in a form in a format that people can understand. And, you know, there's nothing that can't be explained to somebody if you want to. What I've also learned is that if you want to use science to confuse rather than clarify, you can also do that. There's an entire industry called manufactured uncertainty, and we deal with that. And so this is kind of an underlying theme that we continue to hear is our requests for data have been very specific and the responses we've been given is anything but uh, responsive to what it is that we're looking for. Uh, we're not assuming ill intent, but we are trying to ensure 
Um, as has been pointed out, we're members of an advisory panel. We're not decision makers. We respect the role of the decision makers and the leaders of the Pacific and beyond um, to have that role. But for us to do our job, um, it would be really great if we would be able to get access to the information uh, that we really need. And that's really worrisome. If we don't get the data, um, either they're not forthcoming or they don't exist, that is immediately an, uh, an indication of why this should not go forward. Um, I only have four slides, no graphs, promise. Um, but what I wanted to do is kind of take it to the biology um, and the linkage between environmental health and human health. And these two are just inextricably linked. Um, on the left-hand side, we're dealing with radionuclides, <laughs> no smiley face on the tritium and no tail on purpose, um, two neutrons and a proton. That's what it is. On the bottom is carbon-14. The reason I chose these two out of the 64 that are supposedly being measured is they give kind of endpoints. Carbon and uh, hydrogen are the building blocks of life. And so for that reason, it's no surprise that when you have radionuclides, um, radioactive versions of hydrogen and carbon, they do get bound up in living creatures. They do get transferred up from one trophic level to another. They do um, get accumulated and they do get passed on. So on the left-hand side, tritium has a half-life of 12.3 years, as um, uh, Dr. Bustler pointed out. Carbon-14, 5,730 years. So that's the other point to make, is some of these radionuclides are extremely long-lived with very long half-lives. Um, they even make me look young in, uh, in comparison, which is saying something. But if you look then at carbon and hydrogen as the basis for two of them, they easily get taken up into the beautiful green picture there of phytoplankton. Now, these are tiny microscopic plants that live in the ocean. Uh, the cloudy gray and green water you see off of Tokyo, off of San Francisco, off of New York, off of any developed area is due to the abundance of phytoplankton. And these things immediately take up um, a variety of radionuclides, but carbon and hydrogen in particular. Uh, these form the basis of most food webs and the beautiful colored picture uh, underneath that of all these crazy looking creatures are zooplankton, microscopic animals that feed on the plants and they become the food source for everything from larval fish. Uh, the lower right hand corner, those little fish you see, those are larval tuna. Um, this is what they feed on as well. And then there's the direct link into people. And so this is what I really want to point out is that there is a direct biological pathway by which radionuclides get into the environment. Um, they get taken up by organisms. They get pulled up through the various food uh, connections in the ocean, and they eventually get to people. And this really matters in terms of public health and chemistry. First, we'll start with the chemistry. Many of the things that we've been presented um, that um, Ken and Arjun and Ferenc talked about is treating um, this disaster, which was so unfortunate, as a chemical problem. Um, as a biologist, I always look at things from that biological perspective. If the ocean were a sterile glass walled vessel, the chemistry of dilution would make sense. As soon as you add living creatures to the mix, which is what the ocean is full of, then you get away from dilution and you get into biological concentration. And there is the concern we have um, is how this stuff is taken up and then how it moves its way into people. The other thing that you'll see throughout the reports that we picked apart is a lot of focus in on what's called low level radiation emitters, beta emitters. Beta, um, there are basically alpha, beta, and gamma emitters. We won't go into it here. Um, can talk a little bit more about the radiation. Even though beta emitters are considered relatively low energy and um, beta particles can be blocked um, fairly easily. There's a difference between whether it's an external or an internal exposure. And if you eat things that have beta emitters in them and they get to you inside, your cells are no longer protected. And that's a very big concern we have. So treating everything as a chemical problem without looking at the biological realities is one of the major concerns we've all discussed. And when we look at an ocean full of plants and animals, with over 1.3 million tons of radioactive water being planned to be released into the ocean, we know these things will get picked up. Um, there was a study done uh, on tuna that showed that uh, within a year of the um, disaster that occurred in 2011, uh, some tuna that were sampled off of San Diego and California 
had cesium that could be directly tied to Fukushima. And again, the quantity, quantity quality, and distribution does matter. Um, but what is indicative is that you can move things by ocean currents, as Ken very uh, clearly and eloquently explained, but they also move around with the uh, uh, animals in the ocean and pelagic fish move all across these oceans as well. And that's why we consider this to be very much a transboundary issue is that this water will not remain within the territorial waters of Japan. And that's why it is totally appropriate uh, for the Pacific Island Forum to be concerned because we know already uh, that organisms that were exposed are within these exclusive economic zones and they are a concern going forward. Next slide, please. So again, this linkage between environmental health and human health, all of the things that matter. I've had the good fortune of being able to work in the Pacific Islands for 44 years now. Um, among my more interesting um, experiences was I lived and did my doctoral dissertation research on Enowetok Atoll, 1980, 81, 82. Some of you may be familiar, that was a nuclear testing site, one of many um, throughout the Pacific Islands. And as Secretary General Puna said in the beginning, there is a long history of the Pacific Islands um, being the home for testing of uh, everything from nuclear weapons to um, discharges that are being proposed now. And uh, for all of these problems to fall on the Pacific Islands, the people who call these islands and the surrounding ocean home is a real tragedy. Um, this affects food security, um, cultural identity and practices, fishing and ocean activities are the core of many Pacific Island cultures and societies. And when we begin to interfere uh, with the health and safety and the ability for people to have access to healthful uh, marine resources, that becomes an issue of food security, cultural identity, community health. Um, it affects their economies. These are very important issues to be raised for the fisheries. Um, it deals with ecological integrity, that all of these units are interconnected and something that we all uh, realize that this is not only um, transboundary, but it's transgenerational. When we look at the half-lives of some of these radionuclides, this will be going on for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren and generations to come. And that's been one of the features I've so much enjoyed in working with Pacific Island leaders is their effort to always look at what today's actions mean to future generations. Um, a common denominator we have among all of us who are on this panel, uh, we can be identified as scientists, uh, but we're also parents. And so the way in which we look at things is not only as an academic enterprise, but rather what legacy do we leave for the future? And the Pacific Islands have always had incredible leadership in being able to demonstrate the need for intergenerational responsibility, which is really the core of environmental um, sustainability. How do we meet today's needs without compromising the needs of future generations? Okay, next slide, go ahead. Um, and so this is, I'm gonna nerd out a little bit here, you know, as a scientist that I am, um, but the take home point is that the policies that we use today are simply not kept up with scientific advancements. Science is advancing on a weekly, monthly, almost daily basis. And yet many of the policies that are being used now including the ones that we've been up against with the International Atomic Energy Agency and the partners in this effort now are simply outdated. They don't reflect the best available science, the knowledge we have today. Um, much has been said about uh, low level radiation, beta emitters. Um, my upper point in yellow, all radioisotopes have the potential to be hazardous, especially if inhaled or ingested. And that includes things like tritium and carbon-14. What you get exposed to external, externally is different than what happens internally. And the reason is the way in which cells are exposed. Um, Bio 101, and I won't go into that too much detail, but all cells of higher organisms, whether it's fish or corals, where I spend a lot of my times, or people, um, we have cells that have a nucleus in which a lot of our DNA for genetic information is housed. And then there are other types of DNA in the cell, including those that are held within the power cells, the power packs from the cell, which are called mitochondria. The way in which they react to even low level um, emissions differs uh, tremendously. And so even though nuclear DNA has evolved protections to protect the genetic information transferred from one generation to the next, 
the metabolic parts of our DNA and the mitochondria do not have those same protections. And that can lead to all kinds of sublethal problems. Cancer is something that most people are associating uh, with radiation, but there can be other metabolic problems and we have tools to be able to understand that now. And we really need to take this into account in anything going forward. This is not a chemistry experiment. This has real implications on ocean life and the human lives that are tied to our oceans now and into the future. Next slide. And so I'll end on this note um, that this is truly a tragedy and our hearts go out to the people of Japan. Um, nobody expected this, nobody wanted this, nobody could have predicted this from happening, but it did. And so it truly is a tragedy, but um, sometimes uh, challenges become opportunities. And that's one of the ways in which our panel has been trying to be proactive, is not just pointing out what's wrong with the data and the approach, but other options of going forward in a more constructive manner. Um, just for those of you who don't know, this is the United Nations Ocean Decade. So there is a great deal of international focus on the health of our oceans and the health of the people who depend on that. And so to me, this is an opportunity during the United Nations Ocean Decade to reevaluate, not just in this case, but take a broader view of how we treat our oceans and the people who depend on them. There is a strong consensus internationally. Continued use of the ocean for dumping waste is simply not sustainable. Um, I've got photos of a deep sea submersible at the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the Northern Marianas Islands, the deepest place in the ocean where there are beer cans. And there's no place left on this earth that is immune or separated from human impacts. And when we do things like dump pollutants and radionuclides, these simply don't disappear or get diluted. Um, they get taken up, they get distributed, and they become a lingering problem. And of course, there's cumulative impacts. This is not the first such incident nor will it be the last catastrophe. Unfortunate, but we know it's gonna be true. So this is the opportunity, and we look to Japan, has some of the best scientists in the world. They have some of the best technologies in the world. And kind of our plea from the committee and our hope is that people take a step back from where they are right now and be able to look at this as an opportunity to perhaps be the world's leader in advancing new approaches to a very serious international problem and during the ocean decade to be in a leadership position to say, can't we do better? One of the things that Arjun referred to, um, it turns out that the same biology that will take up these radionuclides that we pointed out and move them through the food chain are also an opportunity for bioremediation. We actually had this discussion uh, in our meetings with TEPCO and IAEA. Um, there is an oyster that's grown in Japan, Crossostria, that pumps over 200 liters of water a day. They're incredibly good filters. Um, they love phytoplankton. So if you dose a tank with phytoplankton, they take up some of the radionuclides during photosynthesis. Um, I did a calculation on the back of the napkin, which is where I do a lot of my math these days. And it would take 5,000 of these oysters into a large tank, would turn over that water within a couple of weeks. The other nice thing about the oysters is they lay down a calcium carbonate, a stony shell. And as Ken pointed out, strontium goes into bone, it also goes into shell. Um, there's an opportunity here to actually look at the same concerns we're raising biologically to turn that around into an asset instead of a liability and maybe add to Arjun's opportunities and alternatives is to look at bioremediation and begin to move forward. Um, full disclosure, we actually offered during one of our talks to say we will do the experimental design, we'll do um, preparation, we'll do statistics, and we'll even help you analyze the data and we were given a very polite no thank you, so at least we tried. And then I'll end with the comment of saying, due to the transboundary and transgeneral, uh, transgeneration, transgenerational nature of the problem, new approaches and alternatives to ocean dumping are clearly needed. And as far as we're concerned, it's the only responsible way forward. Um, I'll add with one uh, philosophical gem, and that is that breaks only work before you drive off a cliff not on the way down. And once this begins to be released into the water, it's not going to be able to be taken back again. And so based on all the information we've seen so far, the lack of information, as Arjun said very eloquently, the more data we actually did get, the more concerning we, uh, more concerns we had as well. So I'll simply say once again, my gratitude to the members of the panel for their exceptional talent. 
Um, it's interesting because I know a lot of the people on the Pacific Island Forum that sat through many of these talks before they reached out to us um, were confused by the data. And we have to admit, as well-trained scientists, so were we. And so I don't think that was accidental. And so these are not easy problems to solve, but they can be addressed. And we think there is a better way. And the most important thing that we can push for right now is to stop this timeline of release this year, take a step back, reevaluate options and opportunities, and provide the decision makers with accurate and adequate data they need to make the informed decisions that will affect um, this generation and generations to come. So I'll stop there and turn it back to Rhea. Thank you, Dr. Richmond, and to all of our panelists for some really good discussions and a lot of information to think about. Um, noting the time that's left, I'm gonna go straight into the questions that have been posed online in the Q&A. And starting with the first one, the question is, is with respect to long-lived iodine-129, which has been detected in TEPCO's wastewater. Um, and I think Dr. Busler, both you and Dr. dalnoki Vares addressed iodine. So do one of you want to respond to that question? Is um, it's, it's basically a question of if iodine-131 iodine may not be an issue, but what about iodine-129? So your views on that, please. Okay, I think I can. Uh, I looked at the data for that particular point. Um, so iodine-129 is one of the 64 radionuclides that uh, TEPCO is supposed to measure. Um, it's been measured 56 times in this uh, in this complete data set, um, while uh, you know strontium-9 has been measured 300 350 times. So it's not measured as often. The range is not much in terms of. Of course, this is just this data set, right? I really want to emphasize that it ranges between five and 22 becquerels per liter, uh, but the median is, or actually between, sorry, it was 0 0.3 to, to 22 becquerels per liter, um, but actually the, the median is about five becquerels per liter, so it's not particularly uh, high as uh, some of the other uh, isotopes are. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add, Dr. Makajani? Can I supplement that? So um, they created in about the same mass amount. They're very close in atomic uh, number, 129 and 131. And because the half-life of iodine-129 uh, is very long, the total amount of radioactivity in that is, is millions and millions of times, tens of millions of times smaller than iodine-139. So we're not, it's important iodine one. Uh, 29 and drinking water is not a good thing or in the ecosystem is not a good thing. Unfortunately, there's a no perfect solution to this, th this problem. Once you have this accident, once you have these fission products, some of them are going to be there for millions of years. And it's part of the reason to not put it in the ocean. So because it'll be cycling through for millions of years. Thank you, Dr. Buesler. Well, just a quick aside, to find out today how much iodine-131, the short-lived isotope that affects thyroids, people go out and measure the 129, the longer-lived form. So just an aside, there's a bit of a puzzle still going on to what the releases were where on land in the ocean. And so iodine is also used for that purpose. They behave the same because of the same chemistry, but these different half-lives can give them different properties in terms of detecting today. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go through this, the list of questions, not in any particular order, but try to keep some flow. So what do we know about what other countries are doing that the, those that also might be producing nuclear wastewater, how are they storing or how are they dealing with any um, similar issues that, that might be happening in Fukushima, if at all? Rens, do you want to take that or should I? Or? Well, tritium, you know, radioactive water is produced in nuclear reactors. Nuclear reactor primary water is discharged. Um, and it, it's produced specially in plutonium separation plants, um, like in France and Britain, uh, Russia, Japan, and discharged into water bodies. And I'll pass it to Bob because I think he was most eloquent about that, that 
that this is, first of all, as Karen said, not a normal operation. So these are normal discharges. They're permitted by regulatory authorities. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. Um, I have um, had uh, much difficulty with the idea that tritium, which gets into our cells, should be discharged routinely into water bodies, including drinking water uh, supplies. Uh, it happens here in the United States and other places. Uh, but I think Bob might want to reiterate the point that he. Sure, I'll give it a, a quick answer. Um, the very elements that I mentioned about how bioaccumulation occurs, is actually a tool and it's been used. There are various ways in which you can use organisms for that. Um, the two years I was at Inuitak Atoll, we studied the cycling of radionuclides through both plants and animals. And so they can be sequestered and the advantage of concentration versus dilution is you have a smaller volume, a smaller amount in a smaller area. And that gives you the ability to do other things that Arjun's mentioned. It can be mixed, especially if they're low beta emitters into things like concrete and then covered over. So there's no chance that they can get into people. There are ways in which you can actually um, even, you know, the storage for things like tritium with a half-life of 12.3 years and a 40-year time horizon, uh, being able to store down and be able to go that direction makes a lot of sense as well. Um, some cases in the United States I've done looked at it, they've actually uh, enabled it to uh, volatilize over time. So there's a number of approaches there. Um, ocean dumping, where it's going to be biologically active and available, um, there's a term called OBT, organically bound tritium. Um, if you look at it, there's a very good literature and it's getting stronger all the time. The tritium does get taken up by organisms. It does, does get organically bound. Um, it's broken down into what's called escapable, uh, stuff that moves around within the biology and inescapable um, organically bound tritium. So it's not just one chemical, it takes different forms with the biology and it's something that could be actually embraced. And that's what we would like to open up those discussions with Japan and TEPCO um, the whole idea of there's a problem that needs to be addressed. Let's look at constructive alternatives. There are better ways of doing it. And the ocean dumping is un uniformly rejected by uh, our group and all the others that we've discussed so far. Thanks. And Dr. Richman, this is probably a question for you and a follow-up of what you've just mentioned, but is it a fair observation that the impacts on biota and human health resulting from Fukushima are different or similar from nuclear fallout? from past wars and testing in the region. So is the is data a common issue in both? Yeah, and uh, Ken should jump in on this one as well. Um, the atmospheric testing was the worst. Um, when you take a look at the magnitude, the volume of the radionuclides dispersal, uh, when the testing went on in the Marshall Islands, in uh, French Polynesia and other parts of the Pacific, it went around the world. They were picking up radionuclides in the Arctic tundra. Um, if you do a core in the Alawai Canal in Honolulu, you can find a layer of radiation, a radioactive uh, material that went around the world during these nuclear testing phases. Um, so the issue, once again, is one of cumulative impacts and continuing to add to the burden rather than subtract from it. And that's what we're very much looking at is mistakes were made and we can't go back in time. What we can control today is how we go forward. And that's why my feeling on that last slide is this is an opportunity, as much of a tragedy as it is, can't we take a good look and use this as an opportunity to examine new alternative routes other than just sticking it in the ocean, because we just can't keep doing it. And it's not just radionuclides, it's mercury, it's pesticides, it's everything else. The ocean is becoming a soup and all people who depend on the ocean resources. So back to the radionuclide issue, the continued dumping in the ocean, I consider to be highly responsible. And I think we can do much better. Maybe Ken, uh, you could talk about the values when we talk about atmospheric testing versus uh, these local events. Yeah, thanks, Bob. You know, as we've said, in terms of the total amount, we're, it's unprecedented, the amount that was shot off into the atmosphere and the return to land in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. That's truly global. Uh, but I also want to, emphasize the difference in the character. We talked a little bit about cesium, strontium, iodine, different isotopes, and you get a different character of release from a hydrogen weapon. A lot more tritium came out of those uh, tests, with the hydrogen bombs in particular, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, another 
isotope plutonium with the core of these nuclear weapons, so it's plutonium, and that's, of course, highly dangerous. Today, some of those weapons testing sites are a larger source of plutonium than, say, Fukushima ever was. In 2011, there was almost no, very hard to detect any plutonium coming from Japan, yet we had this background that was dominated by the testing. So we couldn't detect the plutonium from 2011 over what was already there. And a final point to that is that this tank water is unlike what happened in 2011 as well. So what we see in the tank is water that's hot and acidic that's interact with the core. And so you pick up some of these more called refractories, oftentimes more dangerous elements like plutonium, like cobalt, like ruthenium. We never saw those in the ocean in 2011. That was more an explosion and overheating fires. So things that are either a gas or volatile got into the atmosphere or in those waters. So we've kind of changed the character. And so while there are lessons to be learned from what happened to the radic in 2011, sometimes you can't apply those directly because what they're considering to release is quite different in terms of its character, chemistry, and accumulation. So that's another reason I'm kind of so stuck, as you've been hearing from the whole group, on knowing what's in those tanks. We really need to know that a lot better to really think about a fate in the ocean. Just a quick note on that. This is one reason why we were so concerned about the sludges, because some of these things are insoluble. And when you're cooling the reactor water, you're picking up the particles, the molten core. It's not uniform. It's not, you know, like a ceramic fuel pellet anymore. And so you had all these sludges and they are particulates. They're going to be stirred up when you pump out those tanks. And it's, it's been most troubling to me having dealt with those kinds of issues in the United States and high level waste tanks uh, with sludges. They've been a particular problem and that having raised that, that the issue still has not been addressed because it, it contains these more dangerous radionuclides. It probably has some plutonium, some americium, alpha emitters that you really don't want in the environment. Thank you. Uh, we are at time, but I, I understand that this is a really important and interesting issue for everyone tuning in. So what I would suggest is that we just take one more question. And then what I'd like to do is commit the panel to answering all of these questions offline after we're done here and um, providing those to the Secretariat to distribute. Um, if you've been, if you're registered for the webinar, then your email address is with the Secretariat or um, responses can be posted on the Forum Secretariat's Facebook page. And the slides that you saw during the seminar will also be made available on the Facebook page for the forum. So um, just, a, just a final question to wrap us up before I turn it back over to the Secretariat for any closing remarks. A couple of questions have come in about the role of IAEA in the interactions that you've had with this international body that many of us, I believe, look to as you know, rightly or wrongly as a watchdog. And, and we all understand that they are playing a role with the Japanese government here. And, and you have had some interactions with them. So one of the questions is with respect to whether you requested to be included in the monitoring regime with IAEA for the releases and whether you have any comments on a, on a report that IAEA released in December on the safety related aspects. I'll just make one comment to start and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. If you go to the IAEA website, um, they indicate right in the upper right hand corner, a World Center for Cooperation in Nuclear Field and seeks to promote the safe and secure and peaceful use of nuclear technology. So promote is right in their mission statement. The mission of the expert panel of which four of us here today was to advise the members of the Pacific Island Forum on the health and safety of that. So you see there's two different missions there. We're not judging them. We know they have some excellent scientists. We were actually able to speak uh, with one of them, Dr. Caruso, who was very forthcoming. And my understanding is he's not allowed to talk to us directly anymore, which says something. Um, but you know his position, um, we respect them as scientists. We respect the challenges they face. Uh, we respect Dr. Grossi. I mean, he had to go to Ukraine and deal with Chernobyl. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. 
But this is an issue for us as scientists to look at the health and safety and alternatives, which is different than the promotion of the safe use. So there's a distinction there. My colleagues can jump in on this one. So I can I can say something. Um, so the uh, the report that came out December 29th, I haven't looked at it in great detail, but I was encouraged the fact that it's talking about samples and interlaboratory comparisons. Um, however, I want to read it, reiterate that I'm still concerned about how TEPCO will handle a high throughput um, of, of, of samples and the fact that this is done so late in the game. Arjun? Yeah, let me make, so there is a, the conflict of interest was there with the Atomic Energy Commission in the United States, uh, and it was resolved by splitting up the Atomic Energy Commission, a promotion part, which is the Department of Energy, which deals with promoting nuclear energy, renewable energy, whatever, and then a regulatory part. That has not happened with the IAEA. The IAEA does, you know, isn't responsible for proliferating nuclear weapons. It's just responsible for mon monitoring that. And its record on the nuclear weapons issue is, is very good. Uh, but on nuclear power, it does have a conflict. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, it was very surprising the limited view that they took of how this should be monitored. And we were very troubled and concerned, and I at least was surprised that even the basic idea that we should know what's in the tanks now so we can be assured that the, that the filtration system will work, you know, with one or two passes and not 10 or 20 or 50, uh, even that has been set aside. We certainly, uh, I don't know that we've been invited to monitor with them. Uh, we certainly have been willing to sit down and talk with them in a conversation that we have not had. The last I heard was that, uh, I think Mr. Grossi said this, although I could stand to be corrected from the recording, that the IAEA is willing to sit down with anybody. And somehow mm, I thought that as, a, as members of an appointed expert panel by the Pacific Islands Forum, which which has member governments in the region that are directly, conf that, that the IAEA should have said directly that we'd be happy to sit down and talk with you. That's not something to my knowledge that has occurred yet, but perhaps the secretariat might want to correct me. Yes, one final point. I run a radioactivity lab that participates in their intercomparison. So they're very good technically, as you heard, in terms of testing methods and protocols and teaching those to other countries and other nations. That's one of their missions they do well. But I, I'm extremely disappointed in this idea that you know, by the time they were to conduct any measurement in the ocean, it'd be too late. Right? You've already started to release them. And so now's the time to be looking in those tanks that takes different protocols, different labs, different procedures. It also takes looking, whether you think you can remove all these other isotopes or think there's little harm, it still requires a monitoring assessment in the ocean. And what I've not seen, even though we're starting to hear some of the words about get out there before, during, and after, that's kind of new language. But the devil's in the details. They, they really focus on measuring tritium alone. Sometimes it's cesium. But given the variability that we've talked about, you'd want to have at least a few measurements for things that might bioaccumulate to a higher degree. Uh, Carbon-14 hasn't been very little done on that. Uh, cobalt 60 in sediments. I mean, there's a lot of different things that their groups aren't looking at. So I don't consider them independent and they're certainly too late if we're doing this after the release has already started. That's, that's the worst sign that, to me of this whole review and approval that we're seeing from IAEA. Yeah, I really wanna um, support what Ken just said. Monitoring doesn't prevent problems. It identifies when they occur. And so it's the same thing as saying, I'm going to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day and I'll get my annual chest x-ray. The chest x-ray doesn't protect you. It tells you when you have a lesion on your lung. And that's the problem with monitoring the way that we've been hearing it. We're going to be monitoring for negative effects when they occur. And what that tells you is you identify when the problem is there 
it doesn't prevent the problem from occurring. So I think Ken's point is extremely important. Yeah, one, one thing as a scientist, if we found many basic scientific problems, you know, poor data quality, inadequate measurements, biased measurements, bias sampling time, and none of these seem to have troubled, not only TEPCO, they have an interest, they've decided to discharge, uh, but uh, they don't seem to have troubled the IAEA enough to stop. And I think as uh, Secretary, Director General Grossi said that they are the scientific authority. For a scientific authority to proclaim itself as such a global scientific authority to not be troubled by the volume and character of problems that we found, which have not been denied by anybody, to my knowledge, um, that is probably the most troubling thing. The IAEA should have stopped in its tracks and said, non-representative sampling, sludges, but that did not happen. And that, that should be shocking. Thank you, members of the panel. That's a that's quite a strong note to end on for the moment. Um, I'm really conscious of time and, and respecting everyone's schedules for today. And I want to give the Secretary General, Henry Puna, a chance to provide some closing remarks. Um, for those of you who have posed questions in the Q&A section, those will be answered in time. Um, the panelists will be provided with those questions and answers will be, and responses will be distributed either through the email list and or the Facebook page, as well as the slides for this, this morning's um, webinar. So let me turn it now to Secretary General Puna to provide us some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Rhea. Well, what an, what an interesting uh, two hours it's been. Mine is the easy part. Mine is to say thank you to Rhea, our moderator, and our panel of scientific experts. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us uh, this morning, and also for the hard and very important work that you are doing uh, for us here in the Pacific. And I believe it's not just for us here in the Pacific, it's for mankind, for our global world. But uh, on behalf of uh, the Forum Secretary and our leaders, I want to say a very big thank you to all of you for the excellent work that you are doing. I know that there's a lot of questions that uh, we have and including our people who are listening in online, but uh, I thank uh, the offer made by Rhea that uh, our panel will be available to answer those offline. So I would appreciate your continuing with that work. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, you know, this hasn't been an easy issue to deal with because the reality is Japan is a long standing and very strong partner for us here in the Blue Pacific. And all that uh, our engagement with Japan has been established through the Palm process where meetings with our Pacific leaders happen every two years with the Prime Minister of Japan, no less. And we have continued that tradition. And the last one was last July, 2021, sorry, July, 2021, Palm 9, where the issue of this, uh, of the Alps treated water was raised by our leaders. And I recall a very clear commitment that was made at that meeting by the Prime Minister of Japan and our leaders, that in order to deal with this issue, we need to progress using international consultations, international law, and using verifiable scientific evidence and assessments to guide us on the way forward. And also in that uh, Palm meeting, uh, Japan had advanced what they call the Pacific Bonds Policy, Kizuna, where it was a pledge to work very closely with the Pacific leaders in order to enhance cooperation between ourselves. I believe that, uh, you know, uh, that is why our leaders have set up this panel, so that in accordance with that agreement in 2019 in Palm 9, so that they can be guided 
quite clearly uh, by scientific evidence in order to make a decision that is right, not just by Japan, but also by us here in the Pacific. And that is why I'm so grateful to our panel of experts for accepting this challenge. There is more work ahead of us. Yes, while Japan has announced the commencement of the discharge in the spring of this year, presumably about March or April, we have uh, engaged and continue to engage with Japan on the need to have a very clear uh, position before the discharge can take place. And I think it will be remiss of me not to mention at this closing stage that Japan has responded. Uh, the, Japan has accepted a willingness to have the panel of experts meet with uh, TIPCO or technical people in order to iron out all those concerns and the gaps in the data that our panel has clearly set out this morning. So we're working on that. And for me, that's an indication that Japan is also prepared, even at this stage, to engage meaningfully with us here in the Pacific. But I can tell you that I've also indicated to Japan that that meeting between our panel of experts and TEPCO experts will not take place. We will not agree to it unless Japan undertakes at this stage before the meeting that all the information that has been requested and will be requested by our panel of experts will be provided. Otherwise, the meaning, the meeting, the proposed meeting will be meaningless. So on that note, thank you again, everybody here, us here in Suva, those uh, who are joining us online, and our panel of experts and our moderator, Rhea Moss Christian. Thank you so much for sharing with us on this very important issue today. On that note, all the very best to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General. And I want to leave our participants with your words and the words of our panel just prior to your statement. So I will just say uh, and echo your thanks and appreciation to the panel and to everyone for participating today and to look for responses from this group of experts to your questions and, um, and close the session for today. So thank you again to all.